Bruchim Aboim. Last week we uh, dealt with the uh, topic of uh, food. And uh, again, food was uh, made pleasurable, as we mentioned last week, so that people would eat, otherwise people would not bother. And another thing that God made pleasurable was sleep. It's interesting that with babies, it's the things you have to force them to do is to sleep and to eat, and then we get older, and then it becomes difficult to stop us from sleeping and eating. We, because uh, again, they're enjoyable, and God made it that way. Why is uh, sleep so necessary? Again, it's part of creation. That God made it part of the makeup of man, so that man would have to rejuvenate himself, and that sleep became a part of this. In fact, it's interesting that in the beginning of creation, when the angels saw Adam, first man, they thought he was a god. But then he went to sleep and they realized that he wasn't god because he had to sleep. Now, the Rebbe, the Bhavich Rebbe says that if we don't sleep, there would be no tomorrow, that life would be a single, seamless day. Our every thought and deed Indeed, would be in an outgrowth of all of our previous thoughts and deeds. And there would be no new beginnings in our lives, for the very concept of a new beginning would be alien to us. He says that sleep means that we have the capacity to not only improve, but also transcend ourselves, to open a new chapter in life that is neither predictable nor enabled by what we did and were up till now basically to free ourselves of yesterday's constraints and build a new recreated self. So we really have this on two levels. God challenges a person that if you, yesterday was terrific, everything went well, you, you, you faced all your challenges, you did them, and you're on a roll. Well, guess what? God says you have to go to sleep and do it again. And on the flip side, what if yesterday was just a disaster? God says, guess what? I have a gift for you. You can start again tomorrow. And tomorrow is a new day. And with that comes more hope. So on both ends, God forces us every day to recreate ourselves, to make that new beginning. And every day is new. And a person, that's why the ter term for mitzvahs many times is called Hayom, this day. Because everything, when something is new, when something is fresh, you really desire it more, you treat it better. So really a person needs to look, in fact, they say that there's a little poem that says the past is history, the future is a mystery, and all we have is the present. And that's why it's called a present, a gift. And a person needs to see it that way. Sleep makes that happen. Now, it's interesting because the, the rabbis tell us, based on Kabbalah, that sleep is considered one sixtieth of death. And um, when a person sleeps, Basically, he goes to dream patterns. So the sleep experts tell us there are five different degrees of sleep, and the, the fifth being the most important, called REM. And it's interesting, there are also five parts of the soul. So the sleep process, again, coincides with this, and we believe that when a person sleeps, his soul actually ascends to heaven. And, uh, and then God returns our soul every day to us, life, and this becomes the concept, again, so sleep becomes a form of death, in a sense, and a revival of the dead, and it comes back to us. Now, the, when we sleep, part of sleeping, a great part of sleeping is dreaming. And even though we don't have prophecy today, dreaming is a form of it. It's an interesting thing. Not only that, there is, they tell a story of the, uh, between, the difference between a chassid and a misnagid, two different beliefs in Orthodox Judaism. It says that a misnagid know, it wonders every day, does, he, does, does, he, does God exist? That's what he spends his time thinking. And a chassid spends all day wondering if God exi if, if, if he exists. So what does that mean? So what it means is that a misnagid says that he knows that he exists. The question is, does God exist? And a chassid says the opposite. He knows that God exists. The 
question is, do I exist? What does that mean? That means that there is, that, there is a belief that we really have no existence, that we exist within the mind of God, that we are part of God's dream. So when people think of the universe and they say how old, billions of years, and this, that, and the other, how do we reconcile this? Why do we dream? And the truth is, if you stop and think about it, we're an olam cotton, we're a small world. And when we go to sleep, we create a world. When you close your eyes and you go into the dream sequence, you create a world that's perfect. As long as you think about anything in your dream, they instantaneously exist. You don't have to go through the whole process of being born to make them happen. Mountains don't have to start from the beginning. Oceans are there. As long as they're in your dream and you create them in your dream, they're there instantaneously. And so too with us in this world. That our, this world is basically, according to certain Kabbalistic ideas, basically non-existence, where we exist is in the mind of God. And that's why everything that happens, happens only because God thinks about us every second. So even a leaf that moves across a meadow moves because God makes it move. Every blade of grass. So our relationship with God is that close. We exist exactly with God in, in this dream that is in his mind. Now, we see even today, um, in 1973, during the, the, during the Yom Kippur War, the only reason why the Syrians did not come straight through, there was a unit that was up on the Golan, because one of the generals had a dream that the Syrians would attack. And he told his superiors, and he said he wanted to mobilize his unit. That was the only unit that was there to hold back the Syrians at all, because of a dream. There's a story told of a Rabbi Isaac Yekulis, who built a shul in Krakow. Stories told that uh, of, of, uh, of Isaac was a very poor man, and he had a dream that kept recurring. And the dream said to him, go to the palace in Prague, and under the bridge that leads to the palace, you will find treasure. And he kept having the dream, and finally, he's a poor man, and he decided, he took the, the walk, and he walked all the way to Prague from Krakow. And then he got to the bridge, but the problem was the dream didn't tell him where the treasure was. So every day for a week, he came back to the bridge, and finally the captain of the guard approached him and said, excuse me, sir, I see you here every day, what's your business? And he was a very honest man, and he said to the captain of the guard, I had a dream, and in the dream it told me to come here, and under the, this bridge, somewhere I'll find my treasure. And the captain of the guard kind of chuckled, and he says, for that you came, well, came all the way from Krakow? He says, what a fool you are. I have a dream too. I've had the dream over and over again that if I go to the house of Isaac Ezekielus, that in, under, underneath his fireplace, if I dig underneath his, his fireplace, I'll find treasure. Do you see me going to his house and trying to find the man? Dreams are ridiculous. And when he turned around, Rav Isaac was gone. And when he got home, his family asked him about what happened. He just began to, tearing apart the fireplace. And sure enough, underneath the fireplace, he found treasure. Hundreds and hundreds of gold coins. And with that, he built a shul that stood through the Holocaust and was a, a part of a terror attack. But it existed. So we see that dreams have a reality to them. Personally, it's interesting. I had a dream, and I heard something that I've never heard in anything I've learned. And in the dream, I was walking with my rabbi, and I said to him, then we make a blessing. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you, God. Elokeinu, our God. Melech Olam, king of the world. Now we know that God comes into this world from above. And in the dream, I told the rabbi that the word melech has a gematria of 40 for a mem, lamed is 30, and chaf is 20. So the word melech, king, which means that, we, that he wants us to choose him to be the king, is a descent from above to below with 40, 30, 20 ha'olam into this world. 
So God's presence descends into this world. And in the dream, I said this to the rabbi. And I'd never heard it before. I've never heard it since. So dreams I have, even in our, my lowly state, you still have a certain amount of prophecy, so to speak, a certain gift that God gives you. Even in a dream of what people think about. I Sometimes I'm into gematrias, numerical values. Sometimes in dreams, I find myself doing gematrias and waking up with them. There's, we know that in the Torah, that dreams are very prevalent. That it starts off with uh, Avimelech having a dream when he takes Sarah, Sarah our mother. And Lavan when he wants to attack, wants to kill Yaakov when he leaves. God comes to him in a dream. We know that, and, and it's interesting, both of these individuals saw God in a dream, and so did Bilaam, and yet they didn't change. So we see that dreams don't always change a person, it gives a person the ability to. Yaakov, the famous dream with the ladder, where he saw angels coming up and going down when he left after Esau tried, was going to kill him, went to Lovin's house. Yosef, again with his dreams of the, uh, the brothers bowing down to him and the sun and the moon. And again with those dreams, the Jews wound up coming down to Egypt. And again, when he was a prisoner and the butler and the baker, and then he interpreted the, their dreams, and they were as he said. And the same thing with Paro, with his dreams of the seven cows and the seven sheaves. So we see that dreams are constantly in a part of Torah, a part of this whole thing of sleeping and in dreams. And what's interesting is that there is a certain amount of, as we said, prophecy in a dream. At the same time, there's also certain things that are, are not true, a fallacy that might be in a dream as well. As we know that uh, when Paro tells his dream, he leaves something out because he thinks that it might, that he might think that, that, that Yosef might think that it's ridiculous. So the key becomes is that all of these things that we have are become important to us. So sleep is a way of us understanding a God in the world, is a way for us to change. God has given us this opportunity. What a, what a gift to be able to start a new day, to be able to make a change in our lives, to refresh ourselves, not just physically, but to take a break. Many times, it's interesting that the same thing can happen day after day, but it looks different, it feels different. And that becomes the key. That God gives us this ability, because if it kept coming, even good, we get used to it. What makes us appreciate it is the fact that, it's, that, that we take a break from it. And the same thing with evil. When things seem to be bad, that when we get a break from it, we get to take a breath from it. And even if you can't solve a problem, walk away from it and come back. And that's again what the idea of Shabbos, the idea of walking away, of finding something the next day and finding things moving better. And again, may God bless us that we have the ability to have good dreams and to not be tortured with dreams. Because again, dreams do have something to do with what you've seen. So there are dreams that can be influenced. But at the same time that a person needs to know that if you're having a dream, there was a dream of a uh, woman had who was going to marry a non-Jew. And in her dream, her parent, her mother, tried to talk her out of it and couldn't do it. She was going to do it. And she, she was on a bus in Israel. And this man saw her looking at her watch. And they got into a conversation, and he asked her, what were you doing? And she says, I have to meet my mother at 6 o'clock on such and such a corner. And when the man was talking, he realized, as she was talking, that her mother was, was dead. And how could she meet her mother? So when she got off the bus, he followed her. It was a couple blocks away. And as she ran to the spot to be there at 6 o'clock, she ran across the street without looking. And she was hit by a bus. So at 6 o'clock, she met her mother. So all of these dreams, it's amazing how much truth one can find. And a person needs to know that you have to... And by the way, dreams are interpreted. They have to be true. But the only thing, if you can have a dream, you can even fast on Shabbos. That's how real, real dreams are. You cannot fast on the Shabbat. But if you have a negative dream and you're bothered by it, a person has the ability to fast, even on the Shabbat. You have to make up that, that fast with another fast. But that's how real, even today, that we see dreams. 
Again, may God bless you all that your dreams are all sweet and good and uh, indications of a good and sweet life. May God bless you only with good dreams and good sleep. Thank you for coming.